Good morning, church. Good to see you this morning. To all those that are visiting us here at Avondale Memorial, welcome to you. And to all those that are online, thank you for inviting us into your home this Sabbath. We hope that your time with us will be a blessing. And to all our family over at the village, we miss you. We can't wait till you can join us here in the building. But until then, God bless and know that you are missed. During this pandemic, many people online have expressed their grievances against God. Because if God is truly a God of love, then how could God allow a pandemic to bring such destruction to our world? If God is truly a God of love, then how could he allow hundreds of thousands of people to perish? If he's a just God, then how could he allow people to lose their jobs and to bring stress into their homes? And so as I look online and you can see people express their grievances against God, but the sad reality was that even people that I was connected with were expressing their grievances against God. And the sad reality was that people that I knew during this pandemic decided to give up on their faith in God on the basis that God did not keep his promise, that God hasn't been faithful to his word, that God said that he would never leave me nor forsake me, but yet their experience of God during this pandemic was one of forsaken. It wasn't just people of faith. There was people that, you know, that, were, that had given up on faith, that returned to faith. Some of them were my friends. And while we could have a cheeky grin because we know why they returned, a bit afraid that the, the second coming of Jesus was imminent during this pandemic. But the job of salvation is God's business. Our business is to love them back and to welcome them back into the fold. So we lost some, but we gained some. I want to encourage us in this time of pandemic that we do have hope and that the God that we serve and we sing praises to today is a God that still rescues us today. And I want to look at this through a psalm in Scripture that Alan White calls the shield of omnipotence. The shield of omnipotence. And so the big idea for us that I want you to, to take with you at the end of this message is when you can't trace God's rescue, trust God's heart. When you can't trace God's rescue, trust God's heart. Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, Jesus, your only Son and eternal Spirit. Father, we just seek a word from you to be encouraged but also challenged to have a desire to be more conformed to the image that is your Son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, we pray that you will lead us and guide us and walk before us, and may we choose to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, come with me to the book of Psalm, chapter 91. Book of Psalm, chapter 91. Now, I told our worship team that we would look at verses 1 to 4. We would definitely look at two verses, maybe three, but definitely not four. I'm told that I need to be finished by 12 o'clock, otherwise uh, many people tell me will be grumbling, so I want to make sure I finish at 12. But we are going to read from Psalm 91, verses 1 to 4. So if you have your Bibles there, it'll be on the screen as well. You can follow along as I read. Verse 1, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. This is the word of my Father. Now, when we look at verse 1, the, 
The, the word dwells and abide in English are synonymous. But this text is written in Hebrew, and so those words are not synonymous in Hebrew. And so Hebrew, for those who may not know, is a pictorial language. It creates word pictures. It's quite a lovely language to understand. It's not quite as precise as the Greek language that we will meet in the New Testament, but it's a beautiful language. And so some of the words that we meet in this particular text in verse 1 is abide. And this word just means it is a repeated action. It's habitual. The word dwells means to sit, to remain, and to inhabit. So this picture of, in the Hebrew is the person that dwells in the shelter of God is not somebody that runs to the shelter only when they are in trouble and then goes back away from God when things are great. The picture here is that the person that dwells in the shelter of God is a believer that takes up residence in the shelter of God. This word shelter, it just means secret place. It means covering or even a hiding place. This is where God finds this secret place to hide his people so no harm can come to them. And I would hasten to guess that the people that are given up on their faith has got a misunderstanding of this particular word when God says that he will place you in a secret place to keep you safe. But we're going we're gonna to unpack that today. The word shadow means protection and rest. But let's look at the names of God that we encounter in this text. The word most high is the Hebrew word Elion and just simply means the God that possesses heaven and earth. What a wonderful picture. Most high, we just think God is up high, but in the Hebrew, it paints a different picture, that God, this is a God that possesses heaven and earth. The word almighty is the word Shaddai, and the root of that is Shad, which means breast. So the Hebrew imagery here for God is a mother's breast is where a child will find all its provisions. In that God, we will find all our provisions. So therefore, the Almighty is the all-sufficient God. So we could render this text at the beginning, verse 1, with the Hebrew understanding like this. He who takes up residence in the shelter of God, who possesses heaven and earth, will repeatedly find themselves in the protection of the all-sufficient God. But this psalm, the promise of this psalm is that God will keep us safe. But the question is, well, what does that actually look like? In verse 3 of this psalm, it reads, Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. This word snare in the Hebrew is this picture of a bird trap, a trap that's been set up to catch up birds. It also means to, to um, calamity that comes against us as believers and the plots that people bring against us. The word fowler is the one person that lays the bait or lays the trap, the person responsible for luring believers into a trap. Perilous just means desire, deep pit, or even hell. Now, the idea from this psalm is that there's somebody that's looking at the believer that's taken up residence in the shelter of God and is putting out baits and lures to bring them out, to bring them into a trap. That's the picture here. This isn't some person that's new to Christianity. This is the believer that has taken up residence in the presence of God. Now, I don't know if you've ever been caught in a trap or if you've ever felt trapped, but I have one time in my life, or many times, one time I was driving home, and just before I got into the car, I received a text from my wife. She said, can you pick up some laundry powder? As a good husband, you respond, you say, yep, no worries, I'll stop by and I'll pick up some laundry powder. So I pulled into the local Coles, and you know, I was very chuffed about, I was able to help my wife at this time, until you get to aisle six, and you're standing before the aisle that has all the, the laundry powder, and there's about 120 of them. So which one do you choose? I'm standing there feeling lost, feeling trapped. What I should have done was picked up the phone and called my wife and asked her for guidance so that I could pick the right one. But as women know, us men sometimes, we don't want to do that. We want to do things ourselves. And so I started to go through a process of elimination. I remember that it was a blue and a pink box. 
Okay, well, let's eliminate all of these washing detergent. I remember they had a picture of this pink ball. Well, church, regardless of my process of elimination, I failed. I bought the wrong one. I went home, and much to her frustration, it was wrong. That wasn't the only time. There's been many times where she says, can you pick up some apples? No worries, dear. I pulled into the coals, get to the fruit and vegetable area. I didn't know. There's like 10 different types of apples. I'm trapped. Do I ring her and ask for advice? Of course not. We're men. We can figure this out. I took the wrong apples home, and that was quite disastrous because my kid, who loves apples, is very picky. There's only one type of apples that he eats. And can I tell you what they are today? Absolutely not. <laughs> trapped. There are times where I feel trapped. The thing about traps is that they don't come with a countdown. You don't walk past a sensor and then there's a three, two, one, trap. The thing about traps is that they don't come with warning. Traps are camouflaged. They are, they are you know, very strategically placed so that they can bait and lure somebody into the trap. And so I was watching an episode online and one of, one of the TV shows uh, in America, one of the episodes had duck hunting. And I was quite intrigued to watch it because here in Australia, hunting is not a thing. So I was quite intrigued to learn what do they do when they go hunting ducks. And so when I watched this particular episode, it was um, quite interesting because they build this structure and in the structure, they put shrubs and they put weeds into the structure to kind of let it look like it's part of the natural terrain. And so I've got a picture here that you'll be able to see um, from that TV show. So it just looks like it's part of the terrain. But what the ducks don't understand is that there, is, there are hunters inside this duck blind, ready with their rifles, ready to take him out. Now you can see that there are ducks on the water. What you might not know is that those ducks are plastic ducks. You see, the concept behind these duck hunters is that as the birds fly over this particular duck blind, the ducks look down and they see all these plastic ducks, but they think the ducks are real. Then they descend from the sky and they land at where these plastic ducks are because they believe that all these ducks are a place of safety. So once they land next to these plastic ducks, they begin to try to commune and have interactions with these ducks, but what they don't know, that inside the duck blind are hunters with their rifles and they just pick these ducks off one by one. And so it is with the devil. He's so cunning. He sees us as believers that we have taken up residence in the shelter of God and he's very creative in the lures and the baits that he does to bring us out and to get us trapped in his traps. He didn't stop at us. He tried this on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We can read this in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. And the Word of God reads, Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, well, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now here the devil is quoting Psalm 91 verses 11 and 12. And this is what it says in, in Psalm 91. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. You see the devil is quite cunning here because the devil's lure or bait to Jesus is don't go to the cross. You don't have to suffer. If your God is truly loving, then he wouldn't want you to suffer. And so that's the trap that the devil plays on Christians who have taken up residence in the shelter of God, is to tell that believer that there will, because you are a Christian, there will be no bad things that will come your way. And so then the believer that falls into that trap and, and bad things happens to them, what that believer does is then they, they pull themselves away from God on the basis that God hasn't kept his promise, that God didn't keep me safe. God said he will never leave me nor forsake me, and this traumatic thing has happened to me, 
and then they give up on their faith. Please notice the devil is quoting scripture for his trap. The devil is a masterful theologian, better than most. William Shakespeare in his work, The Merchant of Venice, he wrote, the devil can cite scripture for his purpose. A modern theologian in John Piper, in June of 1981, in an article entitled Satan's Bible Knowledge, he writes these words. Satan doesn't always try to ruin a faith by saying the Bible isn't true. The devil often tries to ruin our faith by affirming some scripture and using it to lead us into disobedience. See, I would like to suggest that what troubles the believers that, that pull away from God when bad things happen to them is because the, the God that they want to worship is a God that they can explain. But when you have a God that you can explain, now you have a God that you can contain. And a God that you can contain is a God that cannot be worshipped. You see, our minds are so feeble in that it cannot under, begin to fathom the glory and the power and the sovereignty of God. And if the God that you seek to worship is the God that you can explain, then that is a God that cannot be worshipped. Because God will move in ways that you least expect it. Sometimes you're going to pray to God and ask him to move a mountain. When you wake up, there's a shovel next to your bed. So here, I want to explain to you how God sometimes works different to how we request. We're in the city of Dothan. There's a, a family there with complex issues. The father has chosen a favorite, and whenever a father has a favorite in his family, it can cause dissension within that family. And so this family has complex issues. It's a big family. Well, this child that is favored by his father is, is quite the, I guess, spoiled brat. And he knows it. But this young boy, he has a, a, a coat that his father has made for him. And he has this dream that suggests that his brothers will one day worship him, will bow down to him. And if you've been a Christian long enough, you know that this story is Joseph. But if, you haven't been, if you're not a Christian, then I want to encourage you with this story. You see, Joseph was, was, was quite a guy that thought that his brothers would bow down to him one day, and his brothers had had enough. And so then they decided, we're going to deal with this spoiled little brat once and for all. And so they take Joseph, and they put him into this pit. And they throw him in this pit to leave him to die, but they take his coat, they want to get some animal blood to be able to convince Joseph's father that Joseph is now dead. I would imagine as Joseph is in this pit that he's scared, that he's alone, and he, he's crying out to the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, asking God to rescue him. Well, God's rescue comes. And it comes in the form of Joseph being sold into slavery. And so Joseph is now bound, he's, in, he's been bought by slave traders and he's walking a great distance without knowing the destination. I would imagine he would be lonely on this long walk to a destination that is unknown to him. Imagine what's going through his mind, the fact that his family were responsible for him to be in this position. What Joseph doesn't know is that he's walking in God's answer to his prayer. They arrive at Egypt, and when they get to Egypt, he's a slave, so he doesn't have much freedom. So as a slave, he's sold again as a slave, but this time into the house of Potiphar. Potiphar is a man of authority in Egypt, and, and they take Joseph in, and Joseph is a man of integrity. Joseph is a man that is faithful and hardworking. And so therefore, he gets, you know, he gets favor from Potiphar, and he works hard in this house. Potiphar's wife takes a liking to Joseph and she makes an advancement that was outside of the boundaries of marriage and, and Joseph does what every man should do in that position, that is just get out, run, and he does so. But the wife manages to grab a piece of his cloak and, and she comes up with this elaborate story of how Joseph tried to seduce her and so puts Potiphar in a trap. Potiphar knows that down deep in his heart that Joseph Polly didn't you know, perform or acted in such a way, but he knows that this testimony is coming from his wife, and he's a man of power and authority, so he has to do something about it. 
And so he places Joseph in prison. Joseph's story goes from bad to worse. He's, he was in a pit, calls for help, sold into slavery. He's walking to a distance. He doesn't know where he's going, ends up in Egypt, a foreign place, a place that he's not familiar with their culture or their food, but he finds himself there. And then he finds himself in prison. All the while, he is walking in God's answer to his prayer. It would be his interactions in prison where he would then later be released and become the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. And only now does Joseph see the rescue of God. And we know this as he's looking at reconciliation between him and his brothers. We can read his words that we find in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. And it reads this. As for you meant it evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So what Joseph is saying with this verse is God kept his promise of rescue. However, God's secret place to keep Joseph safe from harm was to sell him into slavery. God's secret place or covering to keep Joseph safe was to sell him again into slavery. God's protection for this believer was to then put him into prison to keep him safe. Joseph wanted to pray for God to just get him out of the pit, for God to just randomly place somebody walking by and then pull him out of the pit so that he can return back to his father. But that wasn't God's answer. God had big plans for Joseph, but Joseph didn't know he was there. Joseph had no sight of God but God had big plans for him. He just didn't know it. You see, in hindsight, God was keeping Joseph safe, but in the moment, it didn't look like it. What if the moments when we have cried out to God, seeking a rescue from God, and we believe that God has let us down, what if God has rescued us, but it didn't look the way we wanted it to look? Could that be it? You see, because 91.3 says, Surely he, God, shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the peril of pestilence. This word deliver is the same word for rescue, and it's in the imperfect form in the Hebrew, which means that God's rescue is not a one-time event. God's rescue has happened in the past. It is good for us in the present, and it will be good for us in the future. Now, I want to read you some words from an Adventist pastor who speaks on Psalm 91. He writes this, Psalm 91 declares that our God is the most high. He knows the truth about our situation. He sees our heart. He hears our cry. However difficult and entangled the case may be, he is able to bring a way out. Do you sometimes consider quitting your job, leaving your local church or spouse, Maybe your superior at work is harsh or the other employees on the job slander and ostracize you. The standards at church get lowered, which makes you weep. The personality clash with your spouse is strong. Financial problems are adding up. You say to yourself, if only I could escape and start all anew. God's promises that he will protect you. He will send angels to carry you three times in this psalm assures you that God, will never that God will deliver you from trouble and disasters. Put your trust in him. While Satan is our enemy, he is a defeated foe. God's promise guarantees he will lift you up, defend, vindicate, and exalt you. So stay with him until you see God take action to deliver you. I want to suggest something that even in the pandemic, God has rescued us. It just didn't look like the way we wanted him to. Here's a picture of China. You can see the orange on the left-hand side, or it could be, uh, yep, your left-hand side. That's the air pollution in China before the pandemic lockdown. But in just one month of lockdown, you can see the results on the right-hand side, air pollution reduced by 44% just in one continent. The article read, 
earth breathes again. If you were to look at India, here's a photo, and you can see in the background, that's the Himalayas. And so the locals were taking a photo from their village, and then they were posting it on Twitter, and what, was, and what it read was, for 30 years, we have not been able to see the Himalayas. This is how nature is, and how we have messed it up. This photo was taken 200 kilometers from the Himalayas. And for the first time in 30 years, they've been able to see it from their village. God is rescuing even in this pandemic. Psalm 124, 7 verse 8, it reads, We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Our big idea today is when you can't trace God's rescue, trust God's heart. When you pray for him to come and rescue you, just maybe God will show up in a way that you least expect him. Don't give up faith. Hold on to hope. When you can't trace his rescue, trust God's heart that he is for you and that he won't forsake you. This is my message. God bless.